Today we are going to talk about Ada Lovelace, a mathematician, countess and steam engine computer programmer. Welcome to Sweet Defiance, the podcast where we pair delicious sweets with compelling stories of forgotten historic women who made great achievements in science. My name is Beatrice and I'll be your guide to the life and accomplishment of extraordinary individuals. I am Eva, the scientific mind behind this podcast, bringing expertise and knowledge to uncover the wonders of the natural world. Eva chose the topic today. I chose Ada Lovelace because A, I really love programming and Ada Lovelace is like one of the standout figures when you talk about computing. And I think the, the moment that I really got aware of her work and her life, which are both really extraordinary, was um, through a gift from my partner. So I got this book, which is called the Thrilling Adventures of Lovelace and Babbage, mm. <laughs> which is a absolutely fantastic steampunk graphic novel. So it's part biography, it's part fiction, uh, there's source material, and it's just hilariously fun. So yeah, that's uh, I got this book, and <laughs> that's probably the first time I really heard about Ada Lovelace, maybe, I don't recall, maybe 10 years ago. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool reading about her life. And we chose to pair this episode with two things. So Eva, what did you bake? I got a bit inspired by the hairdo on these, this <laughs> rather famous uh, picture of Ada Lovelace with well, where her hair is in these twirls. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll, I'll make something akin to cinnamon buns, maybe. But then, because it's rhubarb season, and I read that the early Victorians were very, um, very fascinated by rhubarb and put it everywhere. So now these are cinnamon rhubarb buns and they taste really great we're going to put the recipe on our social media so if you you can check it out there and of course if you bake it tag us and we're going to share your picture of london (laughs) yeah so of course we had to drink gin and we paired it with tonic water which is actually also historically accurate because they had already tonic water there to kind of prevent malaria 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 Malaria, yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the drink of the Victorians. Cheers. Cheers. Ada Lovelace was born during the Regency period in London. During this time, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, leading to substantial transformations in the way people lived their lives. London was a bustling city, heavily industrialized and characterized by rapid growth and development. The city was often shrouded in fog and smoke from factories and coal fires, which made the air thick and difficult to breathe. The streets were often dirty and filled with horse manure and other waste, and the sewage system was inadequate, leading to outbreaks of disease. By the 1890s, there were approximately 300,000 horses and 1,000 tons of dung a day in London. Oh, that must have stunk incredibly badly. However, London was also the center of culture and innovation. Many famous writers, artists and scientists lived and worked in the city. Social classes were strictly defined. Each class had its own distinct code of behavior and conduct. The upper class, to which Ada Lovelace belonged, enjoyed a luxurious lifestyle and women were expected to be well educated in literature, languages, music and other arts. So, for example, Bridgerton is a fictionalized version of the Regency period, which was right before the Victorian period. Ada Lovelace was born into a wealthy and aristocratic family, and she was exposed to high society from a young age. Her mother was a prominent social figure, and Ada attended many social events with her. Ada Byron was the only legitimate child of poet Lord Byron. This episode is not about Lord Byron, but he's such a prominent figure that he cannot be ignored. He was known for scandalous affairs and wild behavior. He was one of the most famous and controversial poets of the Romantic era, and his personal life often made headlines. Byron had numerous affairs with both men and women throughout his life, and his relationships were often marked by drama and scandal which would have likely had an impact on Ada's social standing. Byron and Annabella married in January of 1815, but their marriage quickly became strained due to their personality differences. 
Their daughter, Augusta Ada, was born in December 1815, and soon after, her parents separated, causing a scandal. Lord Byron went into self-imposed exile in Europe and died when Ada was just eight years old, so they did not have much of a relationship. Still, Lord Byron wrote a poem about his daughter Ada. It's called Last Leaving England, and I will try to read this to you. Good luck. Is thy face like thy mother's, my fair child? Ada, sole daughter of my house and heart, when last I saw thy young blue eyes, they smiled. And then we parted, not as now we part, but with a hope, a waking with a start. Beautiful. Ada was often ill. She was really isolated when she grew up in her mother's country estates. And her mother was often absent due to her own health issues. So she grew up with governesses and tutors and her pet cat, Mrs. Puff. Yeah, cat person. <laughs> Ada learned history, literature, languages, and uh, sewing, shorthand, mathematics, to the level of elementary geometry and algebra. Ada was also introduced to scientific inte and intellectual circles by her mother's friend, the scientist Mary Somerville, a Scottish astronomer and mathematician. We should definitely do an episode on Mary Somerville one day. Yes, we should put her on our list. When Ada was 17, she went to London for a season of socializing. In the summer of 1833, she was presented at court, so she met the king, and some weeks later she went on to a party at the house of 41-year-old Charles Babbage. Apparently, she charmed the host and he invited her and her mother to come back for a demonstration of his newly constructed difference engine, a two-foot-high hand-cranked contraption with 2,000 brass parts. Well, you can think of the difference engine as a very early version of a very, very large pocket calculator. So definitely not fitting in a pocket. But instead of using electricity, it relied on gears, levers, and well, a lot of mechanical components to perform calculations. The main idea behind the difference engine was to automate and speed up the process of mathematical calculations, particularly those involving complex polynomial functions. Those are really annoying to do by hand. Um, before Babbage's invention, people had to p perform these calculations, well, again, by hand, which was time consuming and prone to errors. And as Beatrice told you, London was in full industrialization swing. So there was a lot of engineering needed and people had to do calculations all the time. And this was thought to solve this bottleneck by automating the people away. Charles Babbage would go on to highly influence Ada's life. Charles was described as being, on one hand, a good conversationalist who put great value in connecting with intellectual society. But on the other hand, he spent most of his time alone in his large house filled with books and papers and unfinished projects. His parents were entrepreneurs and he himself went to Cambridge to study math. Charles was intent to reform the subject. He founded the Analytical Society and he pushed reforms like switching from Newton's dot-based notation to Leibniz's function-based one. And I'm sure Eva can tell us what that means. Well, this is mainly for calculus, which maybe you vaguely remember from your own school days. This was co-invented by Newton and Leibniz uh, independently on two sides of the channel. They wouldn't agree on their notation. So how do you actually write this mathematical thing down? Because this just doesn't just fall from the skies. You have to somehow agree on how to write maths. And uh, they quarreled quite a bit for quite a long time. But in the end, we actually used the Leibniz notation or something very similar to it up to this day. Ah, oh, interesting. So Charles, when Charles' father passed away four years later, he received £100,000, which today would be around £14 million. So therefore, he was set for life. Unfortunately, though, his wife also passed away in the same year. He then took a trip to Europe and he was really impressed by the science there and wrote a book about the decline of science in England. He then finished a prototype of the difference engine, which is what Ada saw in 1833. Her interest in mathematics was sparked once again by this encounter. 
Although Charles initially underestimated her, they eventually discussed many intellectual topics. Charles was idealistic early in life, but soon became bitter. He proved not to be good at staying focused or finishing projects, except for his almost 50-year persistence in trying to automate the process of computation. Well, just to exemplify this a bit further, Charles' first invention that we talked now about, the difference engine, was not really appreciated by, by a lot of people, although this being, in his mind, his greatest invention to date. Now, the original pro project had cost £17,500, and Charles claimed that he had spent another 20000 of his own money on these various projects, and then he tried to get further government support to create a different engine number two, which required fewer parts. So he wanted to make a better version of different engine. But this financial support was denied because even version number one was never finished and even the prototype never functioned reliably. So people just didn't want to fund his ideas anymore. And that's when Ada came in and she proved to be a really good balance because with her clear thinking, her ambitious personality, she proved to have great focus on the projects that she was invested in. In 1838, William, so this would be her husband, was made Earl for his government work by the Queen and therefore Ada became the Countess of Lovelace. Ada focused on managing her large household, having three children, horseback riding and studying mathematics. Meanwhile, Charles tried his hands at politics. He ran twice for parliament on a manufacturing oriented platform, but failed to get elected, partly because of claims of misuse of government funds on a difference engine, as we have heard earlier on. Charles also continued to have upscale parties in London, where he invited Charles Dickens, Florence Nightingale, Michael Faraday and the Duke of Wellington. He, d he became increasingly bitter about his perceived lack of recognition. And after Ada's third child was born, Ada decided to pursue mathematics seriously again. She asked Charles to find her a mathematical instructor in London. Now, on the state of maths. On the European continent, mathematics was a scientific discipline in its own right. And famous examples include Carl Friedrich Gauss, who worked on differential geometry and topology, uncovering the properties and rules that govern surfaces of three-dimensional objects. Or in France, Sophie Germain, who we should also make an episode about, worked on Fermat's last theorem, making major steps towards its solution. Just as a side note, it then took mathematicians another 358 years to finally prove the theorem. But Sophie Germain did really good work that was used later on. Now, sorry. <laughs> in contrast to the continent, in Britain at the time, mathematics was mostly regarded as a tool for other sciences and for engineering, which was also reflected in the university education in mathematics, which had a strong focus on being able to solve standardized problems in a very short time. It was not so much about finding out about new abstract ways of thinking about maths, of making big breakthroughs. And this very utilitarian notion of mathematics was slowly changing during Ada's lifetime. Also with uh, Augustus de Morgan, who taught maths at the then still very young University College of London. And we have also already heard that Charles Babbage was trying to get the maths reformed or the maths education reformed. So he and Augustus must have uh, gotten along pretty well. Now, Augustus taught maths in a more abstract and modern way and was the mathematical instructor that uh, Charles eventually uh, introduced to Ada. Well, Ada couldn't officially enroll in uh, Augustus University classes, but she studied the same curriculum as all the college students, just with Augustus as a private instructor. Ada was a tenacious student. She was pleased by the mathematical abilities she discovered in herself. She had ambition to do great things, and she always talked of her insatiable and restless energy, which she believed she finally had found a purpose for. She still had a very difficult relationship with her mother, causing Ada great distress and derailing her from math. 
Ada's health problems worsened in 1841. She received a regimen of medicines, which included addictive drugs such as heroin and morphine. Ada beat those addictions, but she then became obsessed with betting on horse races and in the 1840s accumulated a considerable gambling debt. Yes, mental health care was not optimal, to say the least, during the 19th century. Then she did um, recover and by late 1842, she returned to study math. So now I'd like to talk a bit about the type of maths that she might have studied or uh, that was developed at this time. One example was a Boolean algebra by George Boole, who was another mentee of Augustus. Boolean algebra is a branch of mathematics that deals with a very special type of logic, which is based on only two values, true and false, or you can also represent it as uh, one and zero. And it's a way of reasoning and making decisions using very, very simple rules that only involve those two values. And you might think, well, uh, ha, pff, what's this useful for? How much can you possibly do with these two values? But then, of course, we, na- we know that um, computers nowadays are based on those two values. And Boolean algebra is one of the very fundamental theoretical backbone of a lot of the things we do today. Imagine you have a light switch. It can have two values. So it can be either on or off, true or false. Um, Boolean algebra helps us understand and manipulate situations like this. We can combine multiple switches or conditions then logically using operations like and, or, or not. And is like having multiple switches in a row. So for a certain result to be true, all the switches must be on. If any of them is off, then the result is false. Or, It's like having multiple switches in parallel. For a certain result to be true, at least one of the switches must be on. If all of the switches are off, the result is false. And not is like flipping the state of a single switch, so you can have the opposite value of what it receives. If the switch is on, not makes it off and the other way around. Now, Boolean algebra allows us to do much more. It allows us to simplify complex logical situations such as if it rains and I don't have to bake a cake, I will write a podcast episode into simpler terms and then analyze how different combinations of true and false values affect the overall outcome. It forms the basis of digital systems, so computer programming, but also electronic circuits, where everything is reduced to sequences of zeros and ones. And now we should also keep in mind that at the time where this algebra was developed, electricity and computers were still science fiction. So this had been developed at a time where its ubiquitous use was nowhere near to be seen. Yeah, that's really impressive. And even though I know how computers use the Boolean system, it's, it's impressive every time someone talks about it. So in the meantime, Charles faced many challenges with his difference engine and subsequently developed his idea for an analytical engine. The analytical engine was a huge upgrade on the difference engine and could perform a variety of operations through a programmed sequence controlled by punch cards. Charles had never published anything about the analytical engine, but he talked about it in Turin and notes were taken by Luigi Menabrea. Menabrea then published a paper based on these notes and Ada translated it into English and added extensive notes of her own. During this time, she corresponded with Charles almost daily. Ada was clearly in charge of the project, but sought Charles's approval since she felt she was explaining his work. In fact, Ada went really above and beyond by adding her own extensive notes to the article, which ended up in nearly tripling its length. These notes contained a series of instructions that demonstrated the potential of the analytical engine to manipulate symbols, to use formal logic and perform complex calculations. Now, what makes Ada's notes truly remarkable is that they included what is now considered the first computer program ever written. In one section, she described the methods for calculating a sequence of Bernoulli numbers using the analytical engine. 
ADA's program consisted of a step-by-step -step process, including detailed instructions and calculations, demonstrating how the machine could execute the task. Ada's work caused a stir in society, and she saw herself as an interpreter of Charles's work. She also wrote a 16-page letter to Charles, proposing to take on the role of what we nowadays would call a CEO, while he remained CTO. It took him a while to agree to this, and then Charles did sign off on his next letter as your faithful slave. Ada described herself as serving as the high priestess of Charles's engine. Ada's contribution to the development of the analytical engine was primarily her clear and concise exposition of its abstract operation. While Charles had drafts of expositions and notations, Ada distilled the details into a more easily understandable explanation. What's particularly fascinating, too, is that Ada's vision went beyond mere number crunching. She recognized that the analytical engine had the capability to handle more than just mathematical calculations. In fact, she envisioned a future where computers could process various types of data, including music, art, and even written words. She wrote, for example, that if anybody ever came up with a complete theory of how to write music, you could teach it to compose. Her insights and laid the foundation for the concepts of a general purpose computer capable of performing diverse tasks beyond pure mathematics. We know nowadays that the analytical engine is in fact Turing complete. In other words, you can, in principle, program it to do any operation of practical relevance. It also has all of the very basic features of a computer. There was a user input in form of punch cards, which uh, were otherwise already used for jacquard loom patterns. There was an internal data storage for intermediate results. And there was a processing unit that could combine numbers and logical flows. A printer would be the computer's output. But in contrast to later computers, it still worked in the decimal system, based on cogwheels and powered by steam, and not on the binary system and electricity. What are Chocard loom patterns? Chocard is this type of fa fabric where you have these very elaborate scarves with very nice patterns. And um, they were not done in a manual way, these patterns, but with punch cards with, well, with these holes inside so that you could basically program the scarf pattern. Wow, interesting. So after the publication of her notes on Charles' analytical engine, Ada's health deteriorated once again, and she spent months undergoing various treatments. Despite this, she remained enthusiastic about science and hoped to make further contributions to the field. Ada faced roadblocks, such as being denied access to the Royal Society's library due to her gender, but she continued to have a good social relationship with Charles. They never joined forces in a project ever again, though. In 1851, Ada's health deteriorated rapidly and she was diagnosed with cancer. She died in November 1852 at the age of 36 after being in great pain for nearly three months. She was buried in the Byron family vault next to her father. Ada's funeral was small and neither her mother nor Charles attended. There was still gossip about Ada's scandalous family after her death with claims that she had affairs and lost large sums of money gambling. Her husband William outlived her by 41 years and eventually remarried. Ada's daughter married a poet and became a renowned Arabian horse breeder. Ada's youngest son inherited the family title and lived on the family estate. Charles lived 18 more years after Ada's death and tried to work on the analytical engine again, but made no great progress. Charles published his autobiography, which was a strange and rather bitter document. And since I love weird and morbid facts, I had to share this one. Charles Babbage gifted his brain to science after death. So his brain is now on display in a glass case next to replicas of his machines at the Science Museum in London. Oh, I have to check it out when I'm in London next time. <laughs> Hmm. Well, after Charles' death, his work on mechanical computers was largely forgotten until the development of electromechanical and electronic computers. Ada's notes were then rediscovered in the 1940s and 1950s with Alan Turing coining the term Lady Lovelace's Objection, 
in reference to her idea that machines could not originate anything, which nowadays is a very relevant discussion again. Interest in Charles and Ada increased again with the building of a complete difference engine in 2002, which finally worked as intended. However, no real version of the, the second machine, the more complex one, the analytical engine, has ever been built or fully simulated. Ada and Charles were skilled in technical and abstract thinking, and their friendship was marked by tragedy. Charles' personality and losses in his life prevented him from realizing his ambitions, while Ada's health failed just as she was starting to make her mark. Although the analytical engine was never fully built during Ada's lifetime, her work and ideas were ahead of their time. Ada's first computer program not only showcased her exceptional analytical ab abilities, but also highlighted her visionary thinking. Her contribution to the field of computer science continues to inspire and influence generations of programmers and innovators to this day. You can find our sources in the show notes. If you enjoy the show and want to help us grow, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.